Dear Heavenly Father, we recognize that we are in your presence today, not by choice, but because you have ordained us to be here, to be in your house, Father, because we have come to the hospital for broken people. And Father, we all have various needs, and uh, those needs are right up front now. Those needs are in our pews, and we just ask for your blessings, Father. Uh, for our finances, for our emotional support, family issues, Father, grief, everything that life has thrown at us this week. We are coming to you now, Father, to this safe haven and asking for your grace. And Father, there are those of us who have been tremendously blessed this week. Beyond our understanding, beyond our anticipation, you have entered, you have changed things, you have changed people on our behalf, Father. So we just thank you, Father, for being God and God alone, that person that we can always come to and always call on, and you are always there for us 24-7. Even when we're not faithful to you, you have been faithful to us. So, Father, we pray for Charlie and his wife as they go on their mission trip. We pray for your manservant this morning, uh, Oliver Nelson, who will be bringing the bread of life. We pray, Father, that you will touch his lips, that it will not be his words, but your words spoken through him. And for every burden that has been laid here, Father, we are laying them at your feet. We are taking them off and placing them on you. And Father, we feel better already knowing that you will answer our prayers before we will even ask. So be with us on your holy Sabbath day today and give us a Sabbath day's blessing and answer our prayers according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray that the church say amen. Amen. Watching Kevin and her music. Um, we are going to play for you Deep River, which the Negro spiritual um, that just bring, if you know the words, he's talking about home being over Jordan. And if you think of the people who wrote this song and would have been singing this song, they were in dire circumstances, dreaming of a home way over yonder, right? with that biblical um, imagery of going over Jordan into the promised land. Now, we are no longer looking at um, slavery of an entire race in the way that it was then. We should think about slavery now in terms of sin, right? There are so many who are still in bondage. Are we dreaming of a home over Jordan, are we thinking about the promised land and are we taking people with us to that home? I ask that you meditate on those words as we play.
That was beautiful. <laughs> um, today, the scripture reading comes from Numbers 13, 26 to 31, and it says, They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit, but the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The, Am the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Canaan, the Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone with, up with him said, We can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. Amen. Sabbath church. Um, this song is like a little prayer to help just asking Jesus to like walk with me and walk with us in our daily lives because the way may not always be easy. So yeah. <laughs>
with me. Good morning. Good morning. Oh boy, you guys sound awful sad. Good morning. Good morning. How many people are glad to be in the house of the Lord? All right. You know, I got excited when I pulled into the parking lot. I saw all those cars. I said, man, these people are all coming to hear me this morning. Little did I remember that the youth are having their program over on the other side. But that's okay. We got a nice group, and I'm really excited to, to be here this morning. I want to first of all thank all the participants thus far, my friend Lewis here, who has been leading out. Um, and I want to thank Lisa in a special way. Lisa has put together some really great music this whole month. So let's give Lisa a nice round of applause. Um, Nikki and Carolyn, that arrangement was really interesting. So you need to tell me who did that, because that was, that was a really, really, and Aiden up here, beautiful. I want Jesus to walk with me. Um, I was trying to think about what to talk about this morning, um, and I started to think about excuses. Of course, none of us ever have any excuses, do we? Uh, now, I was just thinking, I'm looking out, out at some of the audience, and I'm going to pick on a couple of people, some friends of mine. I'm thinking about, um, let's, let's, let, let, me, let me paint the picture for you. Elizabeth has made some really great muffins, like the one she had fixed a couple of weeks ago. And she tells Keith, Keith, I want you to get those muffins out at 530 because they got to be ready for the church the next day. But, and actually, not for church the next day. This is for next week. So I'm going to paint the other picture with Keith. It's Monday night. Pittsburgh Steelers are playing Monday night football. And he's excited. He wants to see this game. And Elizabeth tells him to do that. The boys are playing new video games they have, too. So Elizabeth comes back about 9 o'clock, and she doesn't see any muffins cooked. Uh, and, of course, Keith says, honey, you know the football's on. The, the Steelers, I have to see them under any circumstance. What do you think Elizabeth does to him? How many, how many of us that are married have seen the look? And you guys know what I'm talking about. You see that look, and it's not very pleasant. Or... Um, Let's see. I, let me pick on some. I'm going to pick on, on um, Pastor Ramon and Rayanne. Rayanne, now, Pastor, you know what? I've got this stuff I want you to do for me. Go out and cut that grass. Sabbath's getting ready to come in. So Pastor says, sure, honey, I'll do it for you. Oh, uh, Rayanne gets in about 7 after she's looked at a bunch of eyes, and she's sick of looking at eyes. And the, the grass is not gone. And, and, and the pastor says, she said, oh, well, Ramon, why didn't you cut that grass? He said, you know, I was in deep prayer, honey. The prayer, it was really deep. And I just passed by and Ray and gives him that look. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Roy, Roy and Karen have been married just a short time, so Karen doesn't give him that look at all. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even going to worry about that. Um, but we've all had those kind of situations. You know, honey, I meant to cut the grass, but the World Series is on. I just couldn't miss this historic event. Mom, I plan to get an A in the class, but the teacher is not very good, and the class is way too boring. Um, and here's one classic one for us church members. Pastor, I know I was elected to be Sabbath school teacher, but Sabbath school is way too early. Why don't we change the time from 9.30 to 11? That way I can make sure I'm on time. Now, you all know what I'm talking about? So we've all had excuses for a variety of reasons. But let's look at what the word excuse means. I went and looked it up in Webster's Dictionary. And it says and it's, it's an expression of regret for failure to do something. Um, and this is as a verb. But then it says this too as a noun. It says to grant exemption or to release. We use it most of the time as an expression of regret for failure to do something. Christ provided salvation for us. He granted us a release. So I'm glad Christ excused us from the penalty that we would have to pay. And I was trying to find a, a Bible story to really talk about this. The children of Israel, and I don't like to beat up on them, but they, they can be beat up on a lot of times. 
those guys were full of excuses. Let's kind of go through some of the excuses that the children of Israel had had. First of all, when they left Egypt, they finally got up going. What happened? Pharaoh was behind them. The Red Sea was before them. Did they start to have some excuses? Why did we leave Egypt? And that's their classic excuse. Why did we leave Egypt? We had leeks there. We had food there. We had all this stuff. And this guy, crazy Moses, is taking us out here. And we, how are we going to make it through this situation? Did they make it through the situation? Absolutely. They made it through the situation. Which brings us back to the, the text that my friend Sharon read this morning in Numbers 13. What did God tell Moses to do? They were on the cusp of the promised land. So God tells Moses, I want you to get 40 guys, and I want you to go survey this land, and I want you to tell me what's going on there and see how it is. So let me kind of read it. Uh, they reported back to them. The whole community and the whole assembly showed them the fruit of the land. So what did they come back with? Did they have some grapes? They came. How big were the grapes? Probably the size. It looks like they were the size of, of grapefruit, much as grapes, according to all the stuff that I've ever read. And they came back with pomegranates. Was the land good? Was it as God promised? Was it flowing with milk and honey? So what happened? So you got two guys. Remember, there were 12 guys that were sent out, and they had to go out for 40 days. Hoseas was one, and Caleb was the other one. Who is Hoseas? And where did he get the name? Moses gave him that name. So they went out, and they started to look, and these guys started to complain. What did he say? We went into the land that you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Gav, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. But what did Caleb say? He said, you know what? You guys need to stop. Don't give me any excuses. Then Caleb signs the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take the possession of this land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had came, the other guys, the other 38, said this, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. So in other words, these guys are being devoured. All the people we saw are of great size. We saw, saw the Nephilim there, the ascendants of Anak that come from Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. So let me ask you a question. Did these guys have an excuse? Were they given an excuse? The same God that they worshiped was that the one that took him and brought him across the Red Sea? So I kind of wonder, what is up with this excuse stuff? But you know what? We use it all the time, don't we? We always have an excuse for everything. And if you go into chapter 14, I actually wanted to put that in the bulletin. But um, Anna sent me a name. She said, you know, this is just too much. We can't put all this in there. So they said this. And what did Israel do? They rebelled. They rebelled at what God said. They said, this cannot happen. They talked about the leadership. What did they say about the leadership? We need to get rid of these guys. We need to appoint some other leaders here. Who were they rebelling against? God. The same God that brought them through. And let's talk about the time factor here. How long was the journey from the time they left Israel to the promised land? How many days was it? About 11. So in other words... There was 11 days from the time they made it out to the time that they came up to the promised land that God was going to give them, and they rebel. They're going to take over things. They're going to change things. They said, you know what? We cannot do this. They started to grumble. And what did the Lord say to them? You know what? I'm sick of these folks. I need to just wipe them off the face of the earth. He said, you know what? You guys are done. But what did Caleb say again? We can do this. And Caleb is a very interesting character to me. Caleb and Joshua, both of them. First of all, is there anything in the Bible that's said bad about Caleb? Not that I know of. Is there anything that's said bad about Joshua? Not that I know of. And then Joshua, of course, Joshua came up to some other obstacles there. But 
The interesting thing is Israel had these classic excuses. The biggest one they say is, um, you know what? Lord, why did we have to leave Egypt? So my question to you is, what excuses do you have? What excuses do you have? I want to read a story to you. Are you fulfilling the destiny that God has planted you to be? Mary Jane McLeod was born in a black family in South Carolina 12 years after Abraham Lincoln had freed the slaves. Although theoretically Mary was as free as any the white girl, she soon learned that there were some things white girls did that she couldn't do. The thing that bothered her the most was that she couldn't read. On one um, Saturday afternoon when Mary was about 10, she w went with her mother to the home of some white neighbors. The two girls invited Mary Jane into their playhouse. She pretended that she was the nursemaid and rocked a beautiful doll while her two hostesses pretended to be grown-up ladies. While Mary was rocking the doll, she noticed a book lying on a small table, and she reached over it to pick it up. Put that down, screamed one of the girls. It won't hurt Mary Jane, said Mary Jane. I just want to feel it. No, shouted the other sister. Books are for people who can read. You can't read. Mary put the book down and placed the dolls in the chair. She ran out of the playhouse and down the pathway. She met her mother and sobbed out the story. I will learn to read, Mary Jane said. Her mother smiled and said nothing, for she knew that her daughter could not go to school. She had to work in the cotton fields. Mary Jane picked cotton, but as she did, she chanted a little prayer. I want to read, I want to read. Please, dear God, let me go to school. Before long, a teacher came to the area and started a school. Mary Jane attended. Later, she went away to college and became a teacher. On October 3, 1904, Mary Jane McLeod Bethune opened her own school in Daytona, Florida, which is still there today. This school grew so large that it became a college, and Mary Jane was its first president. Later, she met many important people, but when, when, wherever she went, Mary Jane, Jane told how God had heard her prayer in the cotton field. You can pray anywhere. God will hear your prayer just as he did Mary Jane's. So Bethune-Cookman University is, 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 is still in Daytona, Florida today. Did Mary Jane have an excuse? Could she have made one? She could have made one. First of all, she was black. First of all, her role according to society at that time was she was supposed to stay in the cotton fields the rest of her life and pick cotton. But she made a choice, didn't she? She didn't accept the excuses that society was putting on her. She said, I'm going to learn how to read, and she did. So I'm back to you guys. What's your excuse? What excuses do you have? And it makes me think about another guy, and I'm not going to tell you who this guy is. I want you to kind of figure it out. Actually, there was a movie made about him uh, just recently, and it was actually really pretty good. I got a lot of... I got about 22 pages here, so just hang on tight. We'll make it through. Do you have the guts to fight back? Asked Branch Ritchie, president of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Who am I talking about? Anybody know? Jackie Robinson. Anybody ever see the movie 42? It's a really great movie, and I would recommend it to you highly. Uh, Mr. Ricky Jackie Robinson replied, are you looking for a man who is afraid to fight back? Richie said, I'm looking for a ball player with enough guts not to fight back. Name me a person that is the king of the universe that didn't fight back. Jesus, did he ever fight back? No, he didn't fight back at all. He says, I know you're a good baseball player. What I don't know is whether you can play the game no matter what happens. It's going to take a lot of courage to be the first black man to play in a major league. Some people aren't going to like it. Did Jackie Robinson have a lot of problems on the field and off the field? When Jackie Robinson entered professional baseball in 1945, the only teams he could play for were those in the Negro Leagues. He was playing for the Kansas City Monarchs when Branch Ritchie Ricky, um, discovered him. Mr. Ritchie said, decided that Jackie was the player he had been looking for to help break the prejudice that marred America's favorite sport. However, the man who would do this must be courageous enough to take the slice even from his teammates. Did, could Jackie Robinson have made excuses? Absolutely. He could have stayed with the Negro Leagues, right? He didn't have to go in and make that, that switch over. He could have stayed there. Because Jackie had the right kind of courage, on April 11, 1947, he signed a contract with the Brooklyn Dodgers 
and his name is now registered in the Baseball Hall of Fame. How was such courage possible? In his autobiography, Breakthrough to the Big League, Jackie refers many times to the enabling power of God in his life. He also gives credit to the faith and prayers of his mother. Soon after Jackie's birth, Mrs. Robinson held him in her arms and looking around at the poverty of their homes in Cairo, Georgia, said, Bless you, boy. For you to survive all this, God will have to keep his eye on you. Many times when the going was hard, Jackie felt God's eye upon him. By grace, God's grace, he received the strength and control to control himself when he wanted to strike back. God will keep his eye on us too. He will help us to turn the other cheek. He will give you the self-control. He will give you the courage not to fight back. So I'm going to go back to you guys again because I'm actually talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you guys. What excuses have you made in your lives? How many of you guys are fulfilling the destiny that God has called you to do? Have you got an excuse? Well, I'm too old. Uh, my color's not right. I don't have enough money. There are all kinds of excuses that we can make. But let me ask you this. If God gives you a destiny, can you fail? If you follow him, you can't fail. Israel never learned that in all the times they were out there. They never learned that with God leading them, they could not fail, even though the obstacles get really t tough. And it makes me think about me. Um, I remember once in this church, it was really funny, about, about 11 years ago, I, I, I told people I was going to go get my doctor. And somebody said, you know, that guy's too old to go get a doctor degree. I was 50 years old. When I went to the University of Illinois, I was the oldest person in the school, including the teachers. I had to compete with people that were 19, 20 years old, both playing-wise and academically studying-wise. But you know what? God got me through. He brought me there. He got me through, and he will do the same thing for you. Let's talk about some areas that we might be I give excuses for. What about church? Uh, I don't want to step on any people, but pastor said I could, so that's all right. So if, you, if I step on your toes, you go back and talk to him. Nominating committee is coming up. We need, do we need leadership people in this church? Yes, we do. We need leadership in these people in the church. So somebody comes up to you and says, you know what? I want you, to, I want you to lead this. Oh, no, pastor, I can't really lead. I'll just be secondary. You know, someone, let somebody else lead it and just call me when you need me. So the, the other person takes, takes the lead, and then they call this person, and they say, well, you know, Pastor, I really can't, because I'm just real busy. How many of you guys are busy out there? Everybody's busy. How many people have a lot of things going on in their lives? But can we make excuses? Can we make excuses for what God has asked us to do? How many of you have talents and abilities that are not being utilized in this church? You come here, and you just get, get, get. Did Jesus come here to get or did Jesus come here to give? He came to give. So what's your excuse this morning? We have a lot of different things that we have excuses for, but really we don't have any excuses at all. Then let me tell you about these three women that I read about. These were the first women in the United States that are African-American to get their Ph.D. degrees. And it's really funny. One of them was a seven-day Adventist. Three black women earned their doctorate degrees in all-white Ivy League institutions a century ago. The trio of Sadie Mosul, Georgiana Simpson, and Eva B. Dykes faced massive obstacles to do the impossible, become the first black women to earn PhDs. Um, Sadie entered the University of Pennsylvania at 17 years old in 1915. She wanted to go to Howard University near, and near Dunbar High School where she graduated, but her mother insisted that she stay close to home in Philadelphia. She screamed and cried. She wanted to go to these other schools, but she thought it might be foolish to apply to an Ivy League school. Despite her pedigree, the 5'2-inch uh, black teenager was majoring in economics and was not embraced at uh, Penn State University, even by the other women. So she had a lot of obstacles in her way. But you know what she said? Not one woman spoke to me in class or when I passed one more than one woman in the halls or college or the library. Can you imagine looking for classrooms and asking persons away only to find that the same unresponsive persons you asked for directions seated in the class were you because you were late? 
Black people were prohibited from eating in cafeterias on campus and restaurants nearby also refused them. Mosul appealed to Penn's president for black students to be allowed to get warm meals in the cafeteria. He said he couldn't help her. Could she have quit? Could she have stopped? No, she couldn't stop. She didn't take the excuses up. She, she, she went on to finish her degree and she would be in school for the next 21 years, but she made it. Georgiana Simpson was born in DC when the civil rights, civil war ended. Her exact birthday is, is disputed. Her parents had been enslaved in Virginia and, and could not read and write, yet Simpson decided to pursue a, a career in teaching one of the few professional fields open to black women in the 19th century. She was captivated by German culture and literature and in 1896 went to Germany to study the German language. By 1900, Simpson was living with Helen Pitts Douglas, the widow of Frederick Douglas. That year, Simpson attended summer school at Harvard University and she would be in school again, another one for the next 21 years. She enrolled at the University of Chicago with a major in German philosophy in 1906. Her presence at the Ivy League schools created a scandal when five white female students left the dorm in protest of a black person staying in the dorm. A black woman standing in your dorm and you don't want them to be there. The school president demanded that Simpson move off campus, so he didn't help her. He told her to get out. Simpson had to comply. Her compulsion from campus would be the first of a bunch of nasty patterns of racism toward her at school. She went on and had to make a living, so she divided her time at the University of Chicago with teaching at Dumbo High School. She was in France in 1914 when the war broke out, but Simpson kept her focus on her schoolwork. In 1911, she earned a bachelor's degree followed by a master's in 1920. On June 14, 1991, Georgina Simpson received her PhD in German philosophy, cum laude from the University of Chicago, and she was 56 years old. What's your excuse? No excuses. No excuses for following the path that the Lord have you to pass, have. And then finally, Eva B. Dykes was accepted at Radliff College in 1915, known as the Woman's Harvard. Radliff was adjacent to the illustrious Harvard, which was a university for, by, and for privileged white men. Although women were prohibited from attending Harvard, its male professors delivered some of the lectures to women at Radliff. Dykes earned a bachelor's degree in Egypt and in English summa cum laude at Howard University, but because it was a black school, Radliff did not, um, Radliff did not acknowledge her credits. So you go to school, then you go, how many people have ever been in a situation like that where you've gone to school and you transfer and they don't accept your credits? Is that a fun feeling? I see my friend Ray Ann shaking her head back there. She knows what that's like. It's an awful feeling. Like Simpson, Dykes could, only, could not stay on Radcliffe's campus due to the hue of her skin, so she found a room in, a near, in nearby Cambridge. Undying at these physical slights, Dykes plunged into her studies. In two years, she earned her second bachelor's degree, graduating magna cum laude and the top 13% of a class of 150 students. She was awarded many scholarships. She finally made it through. Um, a higher academic status did not protect Dykes from the, um, from the mundanity of racism. So racism was always there. But she was successful. Dykes managed to completely and successfully defend a 644-page dissertation on the English poet Alexander Pope in 1920. She did not know it at the time, but by doing so, she became part of the first trio that completed her requirements for a PhD. Eva B. Dykes receives her PhD in English philosophy from Radcliffe on June 2nd, 1922. So you got three people here that had all kinds of stuff that was against them and they made it. What about you? What's your excuse? No excuses. What's your excuse for doing the best for Jesus every day? Any excuses for that? What's your excuse for taking up um, helping out in this church, Glendale, to, it can be the church that God would have it to be. Any excuses? Too tired, too busy, all kinds of, we come up with all kinds of excuses. My question to you is this, when Jesus comes again today and sees you, he's going to say either one or two things, well done, good and faithful servant, or what? Depart from me, I know you're not. 
will you be able to have any excuses then? Well, Lord, I tried to do this, but you know I was busy and I didn't have enough money and I just got all kinds of problems. No excuses. If Jesus didn't have any excuses, we don't have any either. How many people are willing to dedicate and consecrate themselves to be the best for Jesus in every aspect of their lives? Let me see your hands. How many people are willing to do that? Lord, whatever you ask me to do, I want to do it. I'm going to ask the guys to show a video. This video I showed to my class um, recently, and this really lays out the idea of no excuses. Technically, 13-year-old Josiah Johnson of Louisville, Kentucky, has a disability. Hi, Zaire. But almost no one sees it because Josiah doesn't see it. Although born without legs, the kid has yet to find his kryptonite. Always did everything the other kids did. But that invincibility was put to the test last fall when Josiah decided to try out for the one sport where altitude is everything the Moore Middle School basketball team. At this point, you may be wondering, why didn't he just join a wheelchair basketball team? It would certainly be a lot easier. Well, Josiah says, exactly. It was easy, it well, was too easy. You wanted more of a challenge? Yeah. The gumption it takes to be able to say, I'm gonna go out and do that. Who has that kind of confidence? Me. <laughs> <laughs> but his mother, Whitney, says it's not just confidence. It's stubbornness. Josiah is very competitive, and if he feels like something is too easy, he's not going to do it. Still, Josiah knew making the team was a long shot. Fortunately, though, Josiah turned out to be pretty good at long shots. He made the team on his merits. And over the last few months has become a real contributor, getting offensive rebounds assists, and because of his unique position on the floor, he has caused more than a few turnovers. He started taking the ball from people. He took the ball from me. I was mad. You would have thought Steph Curry was in the gym. But his teammates say his best play was a couple weeks ago. It was just a moment that I'm going to remember for like ever. It was the end of the game, seconds remaining. Josiah shoots from three. And again, his disability disappeared. What do you want people to take away from this? To do something that they thought they couldn't do. Josiah Johnson, inspiration and proof that all you need to stand above is confidence. What'd you think? Any excuses? No excuses. If a young man can go out and do that, we can do anything that God would have us to do. Has God put a vision in your life? I believe he has. Everybody in this room, everybody that's on streaming land, God has put a vision for your life. He's put a plan out for you. So let's talk about Josiah for a minute. What excuses could he have made? First of all, he could have said what? I have no legs, so I can't run or jump. Because I, because I have, leg, have no legs, I'm very short. There's no way I can become a basketball player on a regular high school team. He didn't make any excuses. How many people think he had to work hard? He had to work really hard to be able to accomplish that. Is he, he a success? Absolutely, he's a success. So how many of you guys, I'm going to ask this question again, how many of you guys are willing to stop making excuses and follow the, blank, the plan that God has for your life. I'm going to follow up with this last one. George Washington Carver was known as the peanut man. He stood up to face a tired group of congressmen in Washington, D.C. The lawmakers had heard many speakers that day. Some breathed a sigh of relief that Carver was the last. They hoped he wouldn't go over the allotted 10 minutes. On the table, Carver placed boxes that he had brought. Out of them, he pulled ink oil, dyes, plastic, cheese, paint, candy, soap, and a dozen other things that he had made from peanuts. For almost two hours, he kept him spellbound as he talked about the more than 300 products he had produced. He explained how explosives, animal feed, 
cosmetics medicines could be manufactured from this lowly lagoon. Amazing, the men whispered to one another. Unbelievable. But just as amazing as the products Dr. Carver had produced from the peanut was what God had made of his life. He was born a slave in, on a Missouri farm and had no one, and no one expected that he would be more than a common worker. Yet when he died on January 5, 1943, he was internationally famous. He had been awarded many medals and 18 schools were named after him. Congress had even designated a special day in his honor. These achievements were possible because George Washington Carver believed that with Christ helping him, he could do all things. He taught himself to read. At age 14, he went to school for the first time. He had to walk eight miles to get to school. He didn't have money to pay for college education, but he saw no reason why this could not be included into all things that were possible through Christ. God supplied him the opportunity. Would he not give him the means to, for, for him to make, it, make use of it? Carver enrolled in school with only 10 cents in his pocket, but God saw him through. So then I'm going to ask you this question. Do you have a handicap? Is there some obstacle in your way to success? Do you feel that you're unfortunate? God can help you just as he helped George Washington Carver. His strength, in his strength, you too can succeed. Aim high and see what God will do. No excuses, folks. No excuses. How many people have dreams and things that they want to do even at an old age? I see some hands in the back, and I see some hands in here. Can you still do it? Is age a factor? Is where you came from a factor? Is money a factor? Not if God wants you to do it, it's not. So I want you guys to think about this. What can I do for Jesus today and every day? What can I do for him? What can I do? No excuses. I'm going to ask Pastor Ramon to come up. And I'm going to ask you who want to dedicate your lives to God to be the best that you can be for him today and every day. I'm going to ask you to come up. And I'm going to ask the pastor to have a prayer. We always have prayers of dedication, which we want to do. But I want to ask the pastor to pray a prayer of commitment. Because it's all about commitment, folks. Are you committed to what God wants you to do in Glendale, in your personal lives, to the world? So if you want to rededicate and commit yourself to Jesus, come on up. And pastor's going to offer a little prayer for us. Let us pray. Oh, loving God, our toes are hurting right now. Because Oliver has stepped on them. Actually, you have. Because you have reminded us once again that all your callings are enablings. For too long we have given excuses in answer to your call. Our lives have suffered. Our families have suffered. Our church has suffered. Because we have been unwilling to step up to the challenge. But as you have reminded us today, all things are possible through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we stand before you today in recommitment of our lives to you and to the calling that you have placed upon them. We do so realizing that we can do nothing apart from you. 
And so we bring what we have, acknowledging that it is you who has given them to us. And we dedicate these gifts to you to be used by you in ways that perhaps we've never imagined possible before. Father, bless each person standing here today and pour out your spirit through them in ways that they've never seen before so that they can make a difference in other people's lives for your kingdom. And Father, even as we move forward in faith and obedience to your command, we ask you to transform us so that in the process we may become like Jesus, who left the glories of heaven and humbled himself to be a servant to us. May we serve one another in his name so that you may be glorified in our lives. And as we experience your glory, Father, we promise to give all the praise to you, for you are the one who has made it all possible. So we thank you in advance for what you're going to be doing through us as we move forward in faith and obedience to your command. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go back to your seats. I want everyone else to stand as we sing our closing hymn. Charlie Pete gets on me because this is my favorite song. So he always knows when I'm, when I'm going to do something that I kind of call it. How many people believe that Jesus lives? How many people believe that he lives in our hearts, but he lives everywhere? So let's sing he lives this morning. Let's sing it with some spirit. Yeah, play, with, play the piano. We need a little swing with this one, sister. Rejoice, rejoice, so oh Christ. 
Father God, we are so thankful to come in your house this morning. We are so thankful through the word that we have no excuses, Lord. We can do anything that you want us to do. You will provide the way for us to do it. Fill each one of us with your Holy Spirit this morning as we leave this place so that we can touch lives and everybody we be from our family, from our friends, to our co-workers, and that you can come soon. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
<laughs> I gotta sing the CD. You come back and sing to me? Okay, good. Play some more for me. We having a um, Black History Club right now. 